Wasn't that beautiful? I'll tell you the verse that comes to mind is in uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 37. With God, nothing is impossible, folks. Uh, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe it is a part of the Word of God. I believe that the Word of God is truth and life. And I believe it's the way. And we don't come here to give you a Christian psychology lesson today, all right? We come here to preach the Word and give you the Word of God. And if you have your Bibles, please go with me to Luke chapter 2. We have all, these last three weeks, talked about the virgin birth. We talked about Jesus' birth. We talked about shepherds. We talked about many things. And uh, I want to just continue this. It was so close uh, to Christmas, just one day, uh, that I wanted to continue with this theme. And today I'm going to speak to you about from the cradle to the cross. From the cradle to the cross. And let me go ahead and give you the outline. Number one, Jesus grew in the Lord. Jesus grew in the Lord. Number two, Jesus was fulfilling his purpose. He was fulfilling his purpose. And number three, Jesus died for everyone. He died for everyone, folks. Jew and Gentile, doesn't matter what nation, doesn't matter where you were born, uh, the color of your skin, uh, salvation is for everyone. And that really is the message of Christmas. You know, very little is said in the Word of God about Jesus from age 2 to age 30. And we know the whole New Testament uh, speaks of Jesus' life. And he did some amazing things. I really don't understand how somebody could have been around Jesus and not understood that he was truly the Son of God. The miracles that he did, the compassion that he had, the sacrifices that he uh, showed, uh, even the death on the cross, which we will see in our third point. All these things point towards Jesus being the Messiah. We had said earlier that there were over 300 prophecies of the virgin birth, but there were also over 232 prophecies of his death talking about his death. So his whole life had purpose. And I tell you, we need to look at this in our own lives. We need to understand that we as Christians have a purpose too. God is leaving you here for a reason and a purpose. God has given you the breath that you have today. And folks, we have understood this week that every day that you live is a gift from God. So in Luke chapter 2, start with me, if you would, in verse 21. Jesus grew in the Lord, and when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And in Jesus' infancy, he, he kept the laws, the Joseph and Mary kept the laws. And one of the things, and folks, this goes all the way back to Abraham, is circumcision. On the eighth day, the males were circumcised, and that set them apart, all right, from the Gentile world. That meant that they was God's chosen people, and, and that was a covenant between God and man. And so you could see Mary and Joseph, uh, being of Jewish descent, wanted to do the things that the Word of God, even the Old Testament and the laws uh, kept, they wanted to do these things in Jesus' lives. They had completed the census. They had had the miraculous birth. They saw the circumcision there and, and the purification done. And, and in a way, that it was part of dedicating Jesus to God's service. Now, look in verse 22. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the laws of Moses, were completed. And again, if you want to look that up, it's in Leviticus chapter 12. We don't have time to go there, okay? Because of the birth, because of the discharge of the water and the blood, folks, it's there, all right? Uh, they were considered unclean. And they would go, and they would uh, go, and they'd go through this, the, the mothers would go through this purification process, 
and, and it is seen there. And, and uh, Mary did that. Uh, it says, they brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord. The closest thing I can see that we do in our church or in many churches is the dedication, okay? A dedication service is dedicating that child to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice, according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And again, because they had the sacrifice of the birds, okay, you could, you could do a sheep and you could also uh, do a, a lamb. A, a lamb, and because they did not do a lamb, there was every indication that Mary and Joseph just could not afford that. It was not any big deal. It was not a thing uh, that set them back anyway. But it again, it shows uh, the humble abode that they had. It showed, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jesus didn't come into a palace. All right, he didn't come in, uh, you know, to to live with royalty and king. He was humble. His birth was in a stable, or uh, even some many believe in a cave, and it just showed the humility. In, in the early life of Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Matter of fact, look, look at verse 52. Just skip down to 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and with men. You see, throughout his early life, God had his hand upon Jesus. And even as a child, folks, he was a normal child. Those days, those, those, you know, two years old to 12 years old, which we'll see here in just a minute, okay? He, he did what normal kids did, okay? The only difference between Jesus and most of our kids, if not all of our kids, Jesus obeyed his parents, okay? He did because he did not sin. He was the perfect son of God, but he was raised... Uh, even history tells us, in the carpenter's shop. And Joseph was a carpenter. Even Joseph died uh, somewhat probably early in Jesus' life. There was history and indications that Jesus took over that carpenter's shop, and, and that's what he did uh, to help uh, Mary with expenses. Hold your finger there and go with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3. I want you to see, he grew in wisdom. Proverbs 3, verse 1, My son, do not forget my law. Folks, we're talking about the law of God, the word of God. But let your heart keep my commands. For the length of days and a long life and peace will be added unto you. Folks, I'm telling you, and I will be speaking about this next Sunday as we been, begin the uh, New Year, the most important book you will read next year is the Word of God. And I understand some of you are bookworms and you just read, 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 read. And you read whatever you want to do. But if you ignore the Word of God, if you do not read the Word of God, folks, you are not wise. The Bible is full of wisdom. Verse 3, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. What does it mean? Always think about the Word of God. How does my life apply to the Word of God? So find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. It tells you, you will find favor with God if you will obey the, the Word, if you will read the Word. And then it says, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and he shall direct your path. Even at a young age, Jesus was in tune with his heavenly Father. He always prayed to his heavenly Father. He always uh, spent time alone, even probably in his young life as he was growing. He had that connection with God. And folks, we as Christians need to do the same. So we see that Jesus 
grew in the Lord. And folks, all of us need to grow in the Lord. And we need to even ask ourselves, have we grown this year? Okay, have we grown in the Lord this year? Are we closer to the Lord in, our, in, in, in just friendship and in, in relationship than we were one year ago today? And if not, folks, we need to make that a goal in our lives. Not only Jesus grew in the Lord, but Jesus was fulfilling his purpose. He was fulfilling his purpose. Look at verse 39. Verse 39, so when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and filled with wisdom, and, in the, and the grace of God was upon them. So we see, even in his early life, this particular time, this instance that we are about to read was when Jesus was 12 years old. Look at verse 41. And his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. It shows their commitment to the Old Testament and to the laws of God. There were three feasts every year. And again, because of the travel and because they probably didn't have uh, the money they went to one feast. And most people that went to one feast would always go to the Passover. And that was the time, uh, you know, uh, one of the important feasts uh, where he spared the lives of, of all the young males. And we know about that. In verse 42, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And when they had finished the day, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind at Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and their acquaintances. Well, folks, I'm just telling you, it's important, especially in this day and age in which we live, to watch our children, and watch our grandchildren. We need to watch them, especially out in public. One of the biggest fears that I remember that struck our lives, Lori and I, we were, we were shopping, and, I, and Jonathan wasn't there, uh, but Sarah Jane was young. You know, I'm going to guess five or six years old. And we were in a store, and if you remember, many of the stores have those round, uh, you know, round hangers where you can hang clothes and things like that. We were paying attention and going along, and we look up, and we cannot find Sarah Jane. And I'm telling you, fear struck our hearts. I mean, this sinking feeling came over us. And we were hollering for her, and we could not find her. And we looked, and we looked, and finally... With her lip quivering, she came out of one of, those, one of those clothes things. And we said, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you say something? She said, because I knew I was in trouble. Because <laughs> folks, you know how it is. When kids are in trouble, your voice tone changes, your attitude changes. And really, it was fear keeping her from coming out. But I'm simply saying, every, I mean, that is one of the greatest fear a parent has, okay, is that a child is lost or you can't find a child or a grandchild. Verse 45, so when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so what, uh, so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Can you imagine? Because they went a day's journey out, that was one day. They did a journey's day back in, that was another day. And then looking everywhere in the city, they could not find Jesus. So you can imagine how Mary and Joseph 
felt. I mean, fear had to grip them. They had to grip them. They, I'm sure, was going door to door and house to house and business to business looking for Jesus. Verse 47, And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Folks, we're talking a kid that's 12 years old. And I will say this about Jonathan, okay? Again, he wasn't no great student. I mean, he was a good student. Right? He didn't make straight A's, I'll put it this way. But because of the youth ministry and because Jonathan, I took him to every youth event that we had. I mean, he went to Falls Creek when he was like five or six years old. And he followed us. And even at the age of six and seven, he could converse with adults. I'm talking words, full sentence. I mean, even earlier than that, all right? And that kind of amazed us in ourselves. But when we look at Jesus in this thing here, folks, I'm talking he is asking questions. We're talking the scribes and the Pharisees. We're talking probably some uh, biblical scholars of that day. So this was not, they, they, they just, they were amazed at what, who, who this young boy was. And they, they couldn't believe the questions and how his mind and how he could engage and exchange uh, thoughts and understanding. Verse 48, so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son, why have you done this to us? And again, the reason Joseph probably didn't speak up because if he was like me, he was so mad, he knew he would say the wrong thing. Okay? And I will say this also about mothers. God has given mothers a special love. A special love. And my mother treated me that way. I was the favorite. You ask all three of my sisters. They let me know, okay, that, you, that I was the favorite. But you know, my dad, I'm telling you, I could flip my bike, scrape my heels, scrape my face, scrape my arm. Son, you're not bleeding that bad. Get up and quit crying. All right? But the mother, Mary, was simply saying, Son, do you not realize what you have done? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Anxiously means we were worried. We were afraid. Why did you do this? In verse 49, and he said to them, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now some people say he popped off. Some might think he popped off to his mom. But he really didn't, folks. He simply was saying, I so got caught up in talking about the Word of God, in talking about the history of of." of the Word of God and all these things that I had forgotten. I got sidetracked. I was so focused on this, and it was so interesting that I did not want to leave. I do not think he disobeyed his parents, folks. And the other indication here was, was that, hey, he was about his father's business. He had purpose in his life. He wanted to know more about Scripture. And I'm sure he was just intrigued with the temple setting and with these biblical scholars. Verse 50, but they did not understand the statement which he spoke. So you see here, and then in verse 51, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept these things in her heart. Folks, I truly believe Mary knew from con you know conception from conception that her boy was special jesus christ born of a virgin folks that is so important because jesus didn't have the nature of man he had the nature of god and he was god and mary i'm sure as he was growing up she would just ponder, the Bible says, even in another gospel, she would ponder the things he did and the things he said in his heart. And even knowing probably prophecy of the Old Testament, 
she may have even discovered and known what his outcome was going to be. And can you imagine knowing that your son, having three years of ministry, having three years of, of training these disciples, but yet knowing your son was going to a cross that had to be heavy burden on her. So we see Jesus grew in the Lord, and Jesus was fulfilling his purpose. And by the way, folks, do you know God's purpose for your life? Do you know what you are to be about? The Bible tells us that we all have been given gifts, and we've been given talents. Every one of us has a passion for something. It's not the same thing what one may have a passion for. Someone else may not have that passion. But that's why we are all put into church to get all of our gifts together for ministry, for ministry, for the glory of God so that our church can grow, that our church can glow. We, we need to be glowing Christian folks. People need, when they're in the room with us, know that we are in love with Jesus and we were in love with God and we want to serve God. And not only that, we want to give God the glory for everything good that has happened in our lives. And folks, it's not just about being saved. Yes, that is the most important decision that you'll make in your life. But serving the Lord, loving the Lord, helping others is part of our purpose in life. So now we see Jesus grew in the Lord. Jesus was fulfilling his purpose. Jesus died for everyone. Would you go to John chapter 19? John chapter 19. And again, most of you, if not all of you, know what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he was praying. And folks, I didn't think he was getting cold feet. I didn't think he was trying to back out when he said his prayer. He just knew the pain and the suffering that he was going to go through as human. See, he was 100% God, but yet he was 100% man. He knew the nails were going to be in his wrist. He knew the nails were going to be in his feet. He knew the beating that he was going to take. He knew all these things. He knew these trials, three different trials in a period of just hours and the agony and the lying on him. He knew all these things, but yet he went to the cross anyway. Anyway. And the Bible says in verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. And again, folks, I, I just can't imagine a mother having to watch this Okay, and, and I'm just telling you, the passion of Christ, I cannot, I try to watch it every year, but there's some years that I'm just so heartbroken, so, so thinking and in tune with what's going on that I, it, it's hard to watch, folks. It's hard to watch. But can you imagine your son going through that? But yet, Mary did. You know, some people would say, you know, I can't do that. I can't do that. Folks, I believe with all my heart, Mary wanted to be there for her son. And folks, we need to be there for our children. We need to be there for other folks. And his mother's sister was there, uh, Salome, the wife of Clopas. Mary of Magdalene, and we know uh, her story was there. When Jesus therefore saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved, and we know that was John, standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. The exclamation point. All right? He was said it loud when you see an exclamation point. And he was saying, Mom, this is why I came. This is my purpose in life. Verse 27, then he said to the to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. And of course, we know that was John. And John was the closest one to Jesus. And John literally 
took Mary as his own mother. And Jesus at that time was still very concerned about his mother. Then verse 28, and after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst, I thirst. And again, one of the many uh, Old Testament prophecies of Jesus from the cross, one of the, uh, uh, Psalm 22 is one of the prophecies there. Then verse 29, now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, putting on it hyssop, and put it into his mouth. Verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. It is finished. One of the statements that Brother Dalton Barnes, he was uh, our counselor, a pastor over at First Baptist Church of Alma. I'll never forget what he said at a senior adult meeting. He said, never die before you're dead. And I had to ponder that. I had to think about that. And you know what he was saying? If you are living and breathing, you have a purpose in life. Even somebody say, well, I don't want to be in a nursing home and I don't want to be where I can't take care of myself. Even in that, do you know what you could be? You could be a prayer warrior for your pastor in your church. Jesus finished strong. Folks, it wasn't a defeat on the cross. Satan acted like and thought, finally I got rid of Jesus. Finally I'm through with him. But folks, I'm telling you, Jesus finished strong. And bowing his head, he gave up his, his spirit. And again, folks, we know the rest of the story. He was buried, Joseph of Arimathea. He was laid in a tomb. And for three days, he laid there. And then, I'm telling you, on the third day, folks, he arose from the grave. He arose. And the reason you have eternal life today is because Jesus arose from the grave. He conquered death. Our hearts today are broken because of Lucas being gone. But in talking with Mike, I went by the house this week and in talking with Mike, she said the only thing that keeps us going is knowing he's in heaven as we speak. And folks, I'm telling you, I will say this at his service. Lucas is more alive today than he has ever been in his life. Lucas has no COVID today. He is walking the streets of gold. He is, I'm sure, waiting for his parents. He Seen his little brother, they had lost a three-year-old son in a car accident. I'd, I'd heard about it, but I asked him to tell me the story. And they were heartbroken at that. And even Paula said, man, I've already lost one son, and it looks like I'm going to lose another son. But you know what I said? I said, folks, we don't lose children. We know exactly where they are. Okay? Three years old, I'm telling you, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So Jesus fulfilled his purpose in life, and we also need to fulfill our purpose in life. Last scripture, 2 Timothy 4. You know this scripture, but it just really stuck out in my mind this week. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. Paul speaking here, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Can you truly say this in your life? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. A fact in life, folks, and I know you know this, if the Lord tarries, we are all going to die. Everybody. Nobody's exit from death. But According to the Word of God, if we invite Jesus into our lives, if we ask for forgiveness of our sins, if we believe that He truly was the Son of God, we can live forever. And folks, really, that is the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas is salvation. So what is our purpose What is our purpose today? Number one, live for Christ as a believer. Live for Jesus Christ as a believer. Number two, share the gospel with someone. The gospel is the good news. The gospel is the best gift given. The gospel. Number three, give God the glory for everything, every good thing in your life. Have you, will you finish strong? Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, that he grew in the Lord. He was growing up just like you and I. God, I thank you that as he left the cradle, as he left the manger, as he walked towards the cross, as he fulfilled his purpose, we will do the same in our lives. And God, I pray, Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that today would be their day of salvation. God, I pray the Holy Spirit would just convict their hearts. God, I pray that they would just have the courage just to step out and make a public profession of faith. God, it would truly be the greatest day of their lives. Thank you for the Christmas story. Thank you for the virgin birth. Thank you for Jesus' life. Thank you for Jesus' ministry. And thank you that he was willing to die for us. So God, if we as Christians need to rededicate our life, or if we need to come forward to baptism, we've not been scripturally baptized. God, I pray that we would do that today. If we want to join the church, Lord, if they are Christians, if they been baptized, Lord, I pray that you'd speak to them also. God, thank you for the Christmas season. Thank you for the love that you've shown to us. And God, I pray we will show that same love to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.